Hello, everybody. Today I have a special treat for you, a little bit of a different video. Uh, somebody I met quite some time ago, and uh, she's the beautiful Julia Hoffman Bray. She uh, is a master herbalist, a classical homeopath, gestalt psychotherapist, author and flower essence counselor, and much more. I had the pleasure to um, be on her workshop as well, but today we would like to talk about an important topic of hers, uh, something she's been doing for over a decade, I think, or a decade around there. And uh, it is the uh, Haiti Clinic. So could you introduce yourself and how this got started and what can yeah. you help out? Yeah, so I'm Julia Graves and I'm a how to define person who loves to heal others with nature. So I'm using all the modalities which include essential oils and herbalism and everything else. And I've done that actually since childhood. So then 11 years ago, when the great earthquake hit in Haiti, um, my partner being born there, we were immediately very alarmed for the well-being of his father and couldn't go there because all flights had stopped. So he arranged to be on one of the first earth, uh, airplanes after the earthquake that could even fly into the very badly damaged airport. And as soon as he landed, he called me and said, can you be here in 48 hours? And can you bring 10,000 in cash and two suitcases full of natural remedies? And I was in France and we were having a blizzard. So I kind of flipped out and I didn't sleep and I made a million phone calls and sent a million emails. And 24 hours later, I was in New York City where 10,000 in cash and two suitcases full of supplies were waiting for me wow. that I had arranged. And um, I flew to Haiti and that's how the clinic started. So uh, how come you chose essential oils? Uh mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a very clear rationale. I was thinking, oh my God, I only have two suitcases. What is small, light, and goes a long way? And those amongst natural remedies, those are two things only, which is homeopathy and essential oils. You know, you can have a small vial or unit and treat lots of people. You and can dilute also, you know. Yeah, yeah, a very smart choice. So how did you manage to collect so many oils in such a short time? Um, actually, the essential oils at that time were donations by, I used to live in New York, right? So, and I used to be very, very um, um, connected in the Buddhist scene. And we just send out the word through via various networks saying everybody bring to the following place all essential oil bottles you have flying around your home you're not using anymore. You know, the ones that are already open. And everybody just brought their bottles in. And I also had friends who were running the local herb stalls. And because the earthquake had just happened and people were in such a shock, um, I will have to say the shock of what really happened hit home a lot more deeply in the United States and particularly in Florida and New York City than in Europe. And that is because there's a very large expatriate community, Haitians in Florida and New York. So the herb stores were also like giving us big bottles, like 16 fluid ounces, which is like 250 milliliters and stuff of essential oils. And I had friends who were practicing homeopaths who had requested Boyron, the big um, um, manufacturing company. And because the shock and the earthquake was so fresh, we had like a huge parcel from Boyron. I mean, when I got there, I actually checked in huge cardboard boxes at the airport. And the lady said to me, we don't take air, uh, we don't take cardboard boxes and it's too heavy. And I'm like, yeah, but it's medicine for Haiti and I need to fly there. And I'm going to start crying now. We just said, I actually said to my friend who dropped me at the airport, I looked down the check-in line and this is, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'm like, I need to check in where, with the person of color 
you know, I need to check in with somebody who's black. So I said to this young black lady in Brooklyn at JFK Airport, I said, yeah, but you need to check this in for me because I'm going to Haiti and this is medicine for the people. And so she's looking around like this. She takes a walkie talkie and she calls another black guy saying, you need to check this in for me because this is medicine for Haiti. And she's going there and you just have to get it through. You know, this thing that shouldn't be checked. We shouldn't have managed to check in. And there was a lot of instances like that, that people made the rules bend for us to make it happen because they understood it wasn't a humanitarian catastrophe and they just got me through. So it was very, very touching. I think everybody was on their tippy toes. I think everybody just so much wanted to help. And that's something that's also wonderful about doing a humanitarian project is that you see how much people want to help and how good it makes everybody feel, you know, to not sit there and be helpless, but to be able to do something constructively. So I think everybody uh, would like to help in all these situations, like you said, we like to help out, but a lot of us don't know how. So if you gave us a clear way what we can do for you to do this dirty work for us, we are extremely happy to help. So I think this is an interesting way you went, that you collected oils that are already used or people don't use. We all have at least 10 oils we don't use at home, if not 100. So you are still doing the same. We can donate. Yeah. So everybody out there who has oils you are not using or you know you just feel you will donate, we can do this and we will put some addresses where we can uh, they can send these oils. Yeah. So I like to jokingly say that the aromatherapy scene is kind of very upscale and very luxurious, right? When I train um, herbalists, they're usually young, poor hippies sitting on the lawn, dressed in rags. When I teach aromatherapists, they're very well done up, you know, coming from the hairdressers and whatever they're using costs so much, which the hippie herbalists can't afford, right? So when you do humanitarian work, you can't afford to get into chemo typing and nothing oxidated and soft gels and all of those things. I mean, people ask me, how do you use soft gels at the clinic? We never had soft gels. You know, you have to go back to the basics. So we use any oil. I mean, if it's a little bit oxidated, it still works. We don't mind if it's not chemo type. You know, we don't mind. We don't discriminate against the oils. We'll take everything. Whatever you don't want, we'll take. The only thing where I say, okay, that one we won't take is if it's a toxic oil, you know, and we don't use poison. Everything else we put to good use and we get really good results. I've said that before when you heard me speak at the conferences, we use very, very low um, dilutions, which isn't because that's what we want, but because we need to make every drop go a very long way. So talking about dropsmith, right? So how do we craft the drops at the clinic? We usually take a dilution of 1% specifically for all the skin things and people react very, very well because the main problem you see in a disaster area is disease from dirt. You know, the first layer is disease from dirt. So that is enough to kill off whatever germs you have that you want to kill off. It is only later, once the immediate chaos of the earthquake or tsunami or whatever is over, that you have the luxury to consider chronic underlying disease, disease from inherited tendencies to early help in um, health, um, okay. health attack, sorry, um, or whatever it is, you know. So, yeah, in the initial interim, you need to disinfect by and large. Right. And that's also you said, how did I choose essential oils? Because I was thinking, well, 
we don't use antibiotics, what can I have instead? And most essential oils, I mean, if you look at what essential oils are really best at is kill things, you know, <laughs> if I may say it that way, you know, they're like, you, most essential oils are antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, maybe antiparasitic, they're anti-everything. So they are really wonderful. So it's a great, great first aid thing. And not just for medicine, but also we disinfected the, the drinking water with them, the washing water, the cisterns, the water in the cisterns, and which had a huge public health impact. Once you can make the water supply clean in a disaster area, you've eliminated most disease already. It's wonderful. So another thing which our humble Yuya is not mentioning is that she likes to give back. So as much as we can um, offer these essential oils for her to, to help people, they are sharing their um, experience, their case studies, and we have more information to work with in other um, other areas that, that aromatherapists can then apply, whether it's in your clinic or maybe you would like to make your own project for help out people. So mm -hmm. do get on her mailing list. You will then get informed of what they're doing, how they're uh, how they're how they're doing, what we can help, and how you can apply this for yourself as well. Right? And we're gonna share all your contacts. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um, I got some information from your uh, website. It says that you, um, and this is quite old information, that you managed to reach over 10,000 people in need and half of those are children. Yeah. So, of course, half of those are children because the typical, you know, statistical pyramid of population in an underdeveloped country such as Haiti is that half of the population is under the age of 18. So if you see actually the normal cross section of the population, it's very different from here. Here we have so many old people, we have this over aging um, uh, problem, but there you have children everywhere. I mean, one of our big problems at the clinic is to take a case because there's so much squeaking and wailing going on with all the children around you can barely hear you know there were literally moments where I couldn't take a case any longer because there was too much squeaking but it is also very happy this abundance of children and so a lot of what we did is treat um, the normal children's diseases which again is very typical for an underdeveloped country so for instance all the children have worms then after the earthquake, a lot of the children had dust lungs. Then you have just very normal, you know, children's diseases, measles, things like that. You have um, coughs, colds, flu. Um, they're usually, generally speaking, very healthy. So we see very little of the kind of more... Um, industrialized countries, civilization diseases, congenital things, we see really more primitive things like open TB, um, things that poorer people have in poorer countries and a lot of skin disease that are not really counting because it's almost entirely caused by dirty water, right? So a lot of eczema and itches and things like that. So the clinic is ongoing uh, all year yeah. long for all these years? Mm -hmm. Not, no, when we started, we thought it was just, we would just go there and do it once, right? We were there, I think, for three weeks. At the time, we saw, I don't know, at least 3,000 people. It was completely insane. And then the effect was so great. People here loved so much what we did and people over there loved so much what we did and uh, that we said, OK, let's go back again. And we were there again six months later and then again six months later. At those times, the clinic was mobile, right? We did certain locations and then we'd go to orphanages and ghettos and move around, which over time um, wasn't 
right anymore because we couldn't have enough of a sustained presence. So I forget now after how many years exactly we try to transition to be a, a continual clinic, which we've been for years now. What that also meant was that we actually needed to have trained staff there, right? Mm -hmm. So we were able to transition when the people, when you saw me speak, we were talking about the medicine preparators, the people in the background, where we could call out the essential oil blend we would want, and they would mix it together. And over time, particularly two women learned everything just by watching what we did, overhearing what we said, and they became really good. So at a certain point, we start to say, okay, why don't you sit down and take the next person? Let's watch what you do and what you have learned by now. And they were doing so well that we said, okay, we'll transition now. And we transitioned. And now the clinic is open several days a week. First in one, now in two locations. That's because of the Corona curfew that these two women Camille and Marie-Lucie have to work from home. They can no longer go to the original place. So, I mean, now there's also so much street violence. There's a lot of sh shootings. So there's Corona lockdown. And then you can't go outside without get, catching a bullet in your head. So people sneak to their homes at night and off hours whenever there is no shooting. It's quite chaotic, but... We keep on having to adapt and change and do whatever we can in moments we can to make it happen. So it's requiring a lot of effort and goodwill from everybody and a lot of creativity. And most of all, if you want to do something long term, what you need more than anything else besides medical knowledge is patience. I don't know what to say, but... I'm grateful that you exist in this world <laughs> and, and people like you and, and your whole team is incredible. So just uh, once again, what can we do to help? I read on your web page. So uh, uh, donating essential oils, of course, donating money for food. We mentioned that before. That would be wonderful because all the money you get, you give it for food. If you, that's not your thing, that's you can- Sorry, sorry for oils. food. <laughs> Food, but also for things such as shipping. You know, we have to put whatever's donated into boxes on a boat and bring them to Haiti. So that's what we need cash for is shipping. But then also, for instance, simple clinic supplies such as um, now masks or these latex rubber gloves. So we also do, for instance, childbirth. And then the women, of course, need to put on... Uh, sterile gloves to catch the baby things like that so very basic things like that we also need cash for okay so cash for uh, shipping for food and for sterilization especially now or if they have those they can send it to you uh the the sterilized masks and the uh, gloves for example that could be an option yes yes that's an option so if it's a huge amount, then we have to say if we see if we have enough money to actually ship them there. So, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> it's being creative. If anybody has a ship out there <laughs> or a container, yeah, yeah, we'll take a ship. We'll take a container. <laughs> um, so herbs also. Uh, I have here dry herbs and uh, seeds. Yes. Common medical herbs, um, especially sweet. Any? Do you have any preferred things? that would be more useful to you, for example, from essential oils or any of this material? Um, mostly we use the really common ones. So for instance, now in COVID, the most useful have been um, the very obvious ones, peppermint and eucalyptus. So antiviral, brings down the fever, and opens the lungs, great respiratory ones, you know, bronchodilators, you know, get the circulation going. So all the people in acute dyspnea, respiratory distress in Haiti that we've seen at the clinic, so they don't usually come in because there's a huge stigmatization also. So they call the ladies on the cell phone and then they will go to the house of the person and they get there, the person's already all blue, 
can't breathe anymore. And then, so the great Rhiannon Harris once said, no, you can always put, you know, in a bottle of one to one and a half liters of essential oil, one of those oils internally, you can always put one drop, shake it up and give to the person to sip. So within a very quick time, they calm down, the breathing normalizes, they can sit back up. And within 12 hours, latest 24 hours, they're completely back to normal. Oh, and they never go to the hospital. So I'm just trying to tell you, it's like, I, I feel, I need to tease you a little bit. I feel like the, uh, and it's the same everywhere in the naturopathic scene, that the oral aromatherapists always think that if they had one more exotic oil, everything would be solved, right? <laughs> No. <laughs> but my message to you is if you have the 10 most ordinary oils, you can heal almost everything. It is so amazing. So we take any oil and especially also the very ordinary ones like rosemary, lavender, eucalyptus. We love things like clove, everything. The one rarer oil that we've had really great um, success with and a very specific use is yarrow essential oil yes. <laughs> uh, which we found very specifically useful for so malnourished women in a very dirty environment there's tremendous amounts of vaginal infections and leucorrhea and that is very specific for blood tinged leucorrhea where the leucorrhea has eroded the vaginal mucosa to the point where the bleeding starts. So then you make a dilution of an oil, 1% with yarrow and apply it into the vagina. So we can't be very fancy. It's very bare bones. So we teach the woman, wash your hands well, do not use soap in the vagina just apply the oil with your clean fingers and it always works. So my message to you is the simple oils work and the simple methods work. Yes, and you are in extreme, extreme, uh, extreme conditions. So yes, I'm just so grateful that we have you do this <laughs> and I hope everybody is gonna help out uh, I also read that we can uh, send things like um, nasal inhalers. Yes. Um, and what I'm just trying to get like a list I can put out there maybe on the mailing list. Or okay. What mm -hmm. can we, or on the blog below, what can we uh, actually collect for you and hopefully help <laughs> somehow? <laughs> yeah. So we take anything and sometimes people can also email and say is this useful right mm -hmm. so always think that we need to dispense things across the board so what is less useful is essential oils that are used in perfume making only right yes. or toxic oils all the other ones are good what is helpful is to not have these labels on there saying explosive and, you know, these um, skulls with the crossbones making it look very toxic because then we have a lot of work to peel them off. So customs won't look and say, what, you're shipping poison to Haiti and things that will blow up. So if they just look like a normal bottle and the less glass, the better, because it's not so heavy and bulky. So if you can you can pour things together to sh ship bigger quantities all at once. And nasal inhalers are very, very good because, um, so simpler, lighter packaging is good. Nasal inhalers are very good, you know, these smell sticks, because we have a lot of severely stressed, severely malnourished people, especially moms, single moms. It's a very poor country, so a lot of fathers just walk out and leave the mother with the children. And she has to go out and every day fend to get a little bit of money to come back and feed her children. Usually selling something like lemons at a street corner in the beating sun. And then around lunchtime, they very often feel like they're going to pass out. And if we can have them in, give them a nasal inhaler stick and one of the things we absolutely love if we can get some is ylang ylang oil, you know, then to sniff, 
calm down your heart, you know, calm yourself down a little bit, then she doesn't pass out and she has the energy to keep going and stand there longer and make money and actually bring enough home to almost have dinner. So, um, so think really about simple things. Think about dirt, stress, um, pretty unimaginable stress, actually, you know, think about survival we take herbs, also dried herbs that they love. Oh, right now we're also asking for seeds. We're having a garden. Oh. So the new thing at the clinic is, yes, I mean, this is not what you think of, but, you know, in a place where goats eat everything, we got, which is very hard to find, secondhand corrugated tin that we put in the soil to make like a walled in enclosure that no goat can get over. And so we've started to grow things. So if you have seeds of plants that will grow in heat, like all the Mediterranean things or tropical plants, we would like to have those because our dream is also to grow things such as peppermint, yeah. which we've just started and things such as turmeric, because it's an incredibly valuable oil there. And I'll tell you in a moment of how we use it. So we started to grow some turmeric. And um, our dream is like in the olden days here in Europe, the monastery gardens were also gardens where the peasants could go and get a baby plant to take home and grow at home or where they could get an armful of basil or lemongrass or whatever to take home and use for tea or skin washes and things. So we very badly need a field of calendula over there and we're working on things like thyme and lavender and calendula and things like that. So, but to finish up, I said I was going to talk about turmeric and I will. So turmeric powder um, is number one most successful thing for acute hemorrhoids. So not chronic hemorrhoids, but acute hemorrhoids that usually come from acute stress to the liver. So the liver um, swells and presses off the veins that drain the vein is blood from the anus, so the hemorrhoids pop out, or else there's an acute um, bacterial infection in the guts, often things such as Jaldia or um, other tropical bugs. And then if you make a tea with turmeric powder or you eat you know, a teaspoonful of turmeric powder in your food, or you happen to have, which some very rare time, we had small amounts of turmeric essential oil, and you take that internally, they're basically cured like this, the hemorrhoids. So this is something very good to keep in mind, you know? So bitter yellow roots in herbalism are basically always good for the liver and the intestines. You're just so generous and everything in sharing your recipes <laughs> with us as well. <laughs> yeah, I want everybody to get going and to just do it. Yes, me too. I want everybody to get going and get some stuff for this wonderful cause. Don't we feel lucky <laughs> living in just having a lunch waiting for me? I, uh, you know. Yeah. Okay, so um, we will collect all, your, all the data uh, where people can reach you, whether it's by sending it to you or sending directly to maybe help with costs there, where they can donate uh, uh, money or essential oils or whatever. I would like to have a list from you so we can also put a list of the most um, important things you would need to help out. And I hope everybody out there will help out somehow, at least by sharing the video. And um, I don't know, is there anything, any message you'd like to conclude with? I, I, I'm in loss of words. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really think that, I mean, now, now I'm like this plant healer. I would like people to remember that, you know, 
essential oils don't come from a bottle, they come from the plants. And that we as human beings, we are actually babies compared to the plants. So the Native American Indians, they are saying that the plants are, are our ancestors and they are not deluded. They're actually technically speaking correct. All plants, every single last plant in the planet is older than us human beings talking from the point of view of evolution and we are their babies we depend on them we are hanging on the breast of their oxygen that they're producing so please remember to respect nature and the plants they are dying right now if you want to stay an aromatherapist you have to start to become a climate activist you have to start to preserve the planet so the Native American Indians would say you have to be good to grandmother. And um, I want you to understand that because of this relationship, we have evolved alongside those plants. Our bodies have evolved alongside that which was already there, which also means the, that to us, the concentration of essential oils in a plant is physiological. That's what we've evolved to dance with. And then what aromatherapists are doing, and you know, I confess, I also have a still and we also make, you know, distilled more concentrated versions of these things, but that, that is actually not physiological. You concentrate it too much, which that's great if you want to stick it in a suitcase to fly somewhere and help others. But don't think that the more concentrated, the better. And there's already research out there showing that that's not true. Basically, what we're doing is we're distilling, keeping it and re-diluting it to be the concentration we find in nature. So please remember the wisdom of nature and that we've co-evolved with those plants. And the Haiti Clinic is showing to us just how unbelievably powerful the oils are even just at a dilution of one percent so i think that's what i want to say to you as just a word of inspiration to keep going and to not forget the plants and to understand that a chamomile tea is also aromatherapy right so don't forget that yes uh, as you said you're working in very special conditions. So that's why you reach out for them. You reach out for the level that you need. Uh, most people, chamomile tea at the right time would be enough, but then as it accumulates, you need yeah. dosage. Mm -hmm. I, th I think you and your, your project and, and the message are wonderful and I will not win. <laughs> so thank you for taking your time and uh, doing this and i hope this will somehow contribute to everybody yeah thank you everybody <laughs> bye <laughs> see you